warmth of your love and your embrace here in this building. Father, I pray for hearts that have grown cold to you. That you would stoke a fire in our hearts. A passion for your word. And a passion for people, Lord. As we finish the book of James and the book on maturity... Lord, that we would remember what has been written in these previous five chapters. That you would please, God, touch our hearts today. Soften them. Speak to them. Change them. Spirit, move mightily today. I pray that this family and those that are listening that we would be able to forget what has happened even just two minutes ago. That we would truly repent and we would truly give you our attention, our focus. To live for you is our aim, it's our goal. Not just to go to church, but to be the church. Lord, that message needs to be sent so far because sadly, I know your kids know how to play church well. Please change us and help us to really be the church. And we love you, Lord. We thank you for dying for our sins. We thank you for the cross. But in light of that, it demands from us tells us and commands us that we should go and do something because of who we know. And we give you all the glory, all the praise, all the honor, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, can I get another amen? Amen. There we go. Listen, I know it's cold in here. I apologize. I didn't break the heat, just so you know. I do next week we will have my wife make sure to text the owner of the school to that it's working properly for next week because <laughs> otherwise we're doing church at my house. By the way, we we are definitely the crazy church because Jonathan, Ernie, and I went surfing yesterday. And they're talking about surfing into the winter. I'm like, what is wrong with you guys? What is wrong? Like, it's so cold. I remember taking off the wetsuit, standing outside my van, and that 30-mile-an-hour wind, oh, I'm like, I don't love surfing this much anymore. <laughs> we are a crazy bunch, but I love us. Crazy for Jesus. Listen, the title of today's message, if you are James chapter 5, as we finish up, and again, remember, next week we move into the warfare. So read ahead, Ephesians chapter 6. Read the chapter, because that's where we're headed. Today's title to the message is The Purposes of Praying. The Purposes of Praying. Let's read our text, and let's begin. James chapter 5, please Follow along, starting in verse 13. says, is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of the faith will save the sick. And the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Confess your trespasses to one another. Pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Elijah was a man with nature like ours. And he prayed earnestly and it would not rain. And it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its fruit. Brethren, if anyone among you wanders from the truth, and someone turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. I want to pray one more time for our brother, specifically George. Father, I lift up George Cruz to you right now in the name of Jesus. In light of this chapter, when it says, is anyone suffering and is anyone sick? We do know of one brother, George Cruz. Lord, you know him. You know his condition from the stroke, the severity of it, Lord. But my Bible tells me, 
that you are greater than any sickness, stronger than anything that we suffer. Lord, you can heal this man, whether you choose to do it supernaturally so the world would get to see another example of your supernatural healing power, Lord. If it's your will, we ask that it would be done. If you choose to use doctors and medicine and therapy to bring this man back from where he is today, would you do that as well? Either way, we will give you the glory and the honor for how you're going to work in George's life. Thank you for those that care, those that love this man, that will be there to help him through the recovery, Lord. But we do pray for your hand to move upon his body now. Heal that left side, whatever is gone wrong, would you make it right? I believe you can do this, Lord, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The purposes of praying. James finishes the book with a thunder. That's why I love it. He starts off, if anyone is anyone among you Suffering. If you circle the word in your Bible for suffering, please take note. It literally means hardship, trouble. No one in this room ever suffers from a hardship, do you? <laughs> to some it may be, well, the eagles are suffering. or I know, don't go there. Is anyone among you suffering? I think every hand should and can go up. What is so hard right now in our lives? You know, some days I wish everyone for just one day, I wish everyone, we could swap seats. You be the pastor for the day. Let me sit down and enjoy your teaching for a while. Kick back. I see some of you drinking that nice hot coffee and I'm like yeah that's what I want I want it to be easier have you ever said that to the Lord why is it so hard I remember before I was a Christian believe it or not life was easier for me because guess what when I got drunk I had no idea that life was hard. I was just blitzed out of my brain Maybe some of you were high. Immorality. Because it feels good. I get it. Then you come to the cross and you might think that things would get easier. They do get better, but they don't get easier. So make no mistake about it, Christian. Listen, when you truly say yes to Jesus... More than just your Sunday morning service, right? We're coming up to Christmas. Churches get packed then because we call them the C&E Christians. They pay homage to the Lord twice a year. They'll tell you you're a believer, but what do you do with the other 363 days? What happens? They'll hold up a scroll of a list of excuses why they're not in church, why they're not being discipled or making disciples. Isn't that what we're supposed to do? Matthew 28, go and make disciples, right? So if your pastor says to you, hey, are you a disciple or are you a believer? Guess what I got for you? We're going to do this very carefully. No, I'm not taking anything but this off. Okay, this isn't going to work. So guess what? Tune out the... Can you read this? Oh, Lord. Gabe, come up here real fast. Sorry, I thought this was going to work, but apparently I can't even take my sweatshirt off without... You can... No, it comes over the head. You have to take this off. So. Okay, I'm going cold. Oh. That was an epic failure. Can you read it? Oh, hold on, wait. 
Ernie, I need you. No, put that on the ground. Just leave it. Just put this back on my ear. Good. All right. Can everyone hear me? We're good. Thanks, brother. Okay. That was the most unepic unveiling of all time. Sorry. Sorry. Can you read it? I had this. I asked Drew to make it. You know why? Because it's the truth. It's easy to say you believe in Jesus, isn't it? Because it's a free gift. Who doesn't like free gifts? If you come to me and say, Pastor, i got a free gift for you, you know what I'm going to say? Hallelujah. Keep them coming. This is easy. I sit down, you give me gifts. Oh, yeah. Now Jesus says, okay, I gave you eternal life. Guess what you have to pick up? Carrying that cross is hard, isn't it? Let's all be honest and real. Can we just drop the charade? Church can make it seem easy to be a Christian. But let me tell you, if you choose to really follow Christ the way it is instructed in his word, it's going to have its hard times. But the challenge is, what do you do when those hard times arrive? Nobody complains about the hardships, do they? No. So in James chapter 5, sorry, verse 9, James 5 verse 9, are you the grumbler? Are you the complainer? Uh, uh. Are you mad at God because something has happened in your life and it's hard? Does God seem so far away, so distant? Why isn't he listening? Doesn't he know how hard it is? Doesn't he see what I'm going through? Doesn't he see that I am really being tested with this hardship? Guess what we all ought to do? Pray. How's your prayer life lately? It's going to be the theme of the message. Reason number one why we pray is because we are suffering. If you're going through hard times, please turn to 2 Timothy with me because I asked you to turn there and just listen to this and let this sink in. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3, here's what your Bible is going to tell you. You. Who's the you? You. So point, everyone point, go like this. Right? Tap yourself on the chest. Not another person's chest. Tap your own chest. You, therefore, must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Oh, yeah. I'm going to be a Christian today. <laughs> Sign me up. Because it's hard. I didn't write the book. To those that play church and religion in their church, guess what? It's going to be easy because <laughs> you may not have chosen to say, I want to be a disciple, a disciplined one, someone that really intends to carry out and live out the commands that are in the Bible. See, when Christianity becomes optional, seasonal right we're coming into christmas it's the season oh we get real religious when it's christmas or easter but you know what i don't know what you do for the rest of the year and <laughs> only god knows But by choosing to be a disciple, James would say, hey, listen, is there anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Why? Because you might not endure to the end. You might not make it. There could be a trial that takes you out. Listen, I've talked to them. Look at me, please. I've talked to the people who said they were once Christian and now they're not. I've talked to the person who used to be on fire for the Lord. 
in discipleship group, witnessing, doing everything that Jesus would want them to. And guess what? Now they're not. What happened? Hardships. It got tough. It got difficult. And you know me. Listen, I fight for every one of you. I love you guys so much. So when you're going through hard times, we need to pray. Didn't James say we need to ask for wisdom? Did he? Chapter and verse. Oh, you didn't think I'd call you out, huh? Do you remember what chapter? He says, let us ask for wisdom. Why do you think you need wisdom? Because when you go through a trial or something hard and you're under attack, guess what happens? You can revert back to your carnal thinking. Your fleshly wisdom of this world, which will help you none. That's why we need to pray. I don't know what you're suffering from today. I don't know what hardship you're enduring today. Are you in one? Maybe you're in the season, which is the next part of this verse. Look what it says. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms, right? Because God balances our life of hardships with blessings. So the hours in which you've suffered greatly, some may say, Jim, it's a little more than a couple hours. I've been suffering for the last 30 years. And some are chosen to suffer to different degrees than others. Have anyone suffered like Job? Didn't we mention him last week, having the patience and perseverance of Job? Because for 30-some chapters, they had to, he had to, I should say, endure hardship. He had boils. Has anyone here ever had a boil before? Can I see your hand? We have hands up. Wow. Talk to them about getting a boil. It's not fun. He had to endure the onslaught. Listen carefully. He had to endure Satan's worst at a person's life. He attacked everything Job had. That's some in serious hardship. So if you're suffering, whether on the mild side or on the really tough side, I get it. It's difficult. But also think about, think about the blessings and the good things the Lord has given you. Everyone in this room, I see a nice jacket of some sort. You got some nice clothes on today. Most of you, I know, have a home to go home to. Every one of us have cars. Well, some run better than others. Some are in the market, as it were. Do you have a full belly this morning? Well, some of you, well, unless you're fasting or we're in a hurry to get here, maybe you missed the meal. Do we not have so much? So we have the balance that God gives us. And truly, for most of us, I would venture to say, you've had more good than bad. But the question is, can you pray and be cheerful when it's hard. Can you turn to the book of Acts? Let me show you. This is my personal own mission statement. I say personal because you may not want to make it your mission statement. If you look in the book of Acts, chapter 16, starting in verse 22, it says, then the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates tore off their clothes and commanded them to be beaten with rods. And when they laid many stripes on them, they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to keep them securely. Having received such a charge, he put them in the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. But at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the prisoners were listening to them. Did you see it? Paul and Silas got beat for being a Christian. I should say for being a disciple. Why? Because they were verbalizing and telling the world about Christ. And guess what happens? They get beat by their enemies. Thrown into prison. 
And here they are singing to the Lord. Do you see it? I don't, listen, I'm not there yet. Maybe you're a lot like me. The minute you hear something's going wrong in your life, <laughs> God, I, really, here we go again. It's always something. Why me? Have you ever, the why me? Listen, <laughs> call me up. I think I must say this like 10 times a day. Lord, really? Can't I get a break? <laughs> He's like, no, because I'm trying to break you. Oh, God, that hurts, Lord. I know. Yeah, because I'm trying to make you like me. See, listen, let me ask you this. Can I ask you to... This is just, again, what the Lord spoke to me. Many of us, if not all of us, will consistently say how much we love Jesus, but how many of us say we need him? We say we love him. I love the Lord. But when was the last time you said, I need him? I need you, God. I need you. That is what is missing, I believe, in so much of Christendom today. You have so many believers, but so few disciples. So many people that believe, but there's no need. I got saved, okay, I, whatever. And I practice my faith on Sunday mornings, and that's it. Try practicing this seven days a week, and soon you and I will be saying together, boy, do I need you. And we need him way more than money. We need him way more than what we can buy or what we can get. We need him to really be true, full disciples. We need to be praying about this. That's what the book is about. That's the chapter that's at hand to say, hey, am I really praying for those who are going through hardships? If you're going through one, am I praying through? And one way you can pray through, as the scripture says here in, back in James chapter 5, verse 13, try worshiping while you wait. Try looking into one of the Psalms. You've got a whole book full of them. Pick some scripture out and sing over it. I would love to hear everybody's singing voice. No, we're not going to ask you to join the worship team. But instead of being, listen, instead of being sour, try being sweet and singing out to God. Remember what you do have. Remember what he's blessed you with. Remember how much he's given you. Starting with salvation and eternal life. Did you deserve it? I can't hear you. Did you deserve it? You didn't deserve it. But he gave it to you freely. He opened his arms wide, bled out and died, and said, come to me, all you who are burdened, broken, suffering because of your sin. And what did you do? You made the great exchange, did you not? Here's my sin, Jesus. Eternal life is yours. If he never gave you anything else, would you still worship him? Would you? Would you still live for him if it never got better? If tomorrow... You were fed to the lions like millions of our Christian brothers and sisters were through the first early centuries of Christendom. You might never go to the zoo and look at it ever the same. James is preaching to an audience who's getting persecuted. We don't know what that's like. We can't relate here in America. Unless you try to be vocal about what you believe. It will produce some hardships because you will get some people that tell you what they really think about you and your God. And the church might even tell you to be, uh, yo, we don't agree with your super evangelistic approach, Jimbo. 
We don't agree with you calling out sin, Jimbo. We don't like that you point the people to the word and say, hey, does this sting a bit? Because you should be changing. You should be maturing. You should be growing up, should we not? See, Jim doesn't let you play Sunday church, does he? Why would you let one another play church? Why? Because it's hard? Because we don't want to be held accountable? Is anyone among you sick? The second purpose of why we pray, Lord, we need this, is because we are sick. Let's read. If you're sick, we should call for the elders of the church, verse 14, and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Highlight verse 16. Underline it. Please, write it down in asterisks. Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its fruit. The second reason to pray is if you're sick. Most of us probably do this in the quietness of our home or on our own. I get that. Do you handle being sick well? My wife knows when I'm sick, run for your life. Because I'm evil, cranky, cantankerous, rude. It's not fun being sick. But what if your sickness is really bad? There's so many diseases that are out there. There's so many things that can go wrong with our health he says James that is says call for the elders and let them pray over them anointing them with oil in the name of the Lord so guess what Jim did we got our oil I know it may look like a little sample of something that's not good but I didn't have any other bottle my wife gave me this bottle this morning but nevertheless, it's oil. Simply put, do you believe that God can heal you of your disease? Do you believe God can heal you from your sin stronghold? If you have a sickness or you have a sin stronghold, James encourages you, number one, go to the leadership. Get some prayer. You got cancer? A terminal disease? Hey, let's pray for you. God can choose to do the supernatural when he wants and how he wants. It doesn't mean you shouldn't go to doctors and get medicine. You shouldn't go get your necessary surgeries and go through the process. But wouldn't it be cool if we as a small family church started to see people supernaturally healed? Every pastor that I have talked to, the majority say, yeah, they had to work through the sickness. Or even the sickness led to calling somebody home to heaven. That's where they found the ultimate healing. But they've all also said some have been supernaturally healed. So I don't know when God's going to say, hey, it's your turn. Or it's going to be you. Or you. But if he does, man, I can't wait to stand before you and say, guess what? I had Gabe. I had Drew. I had Ross. We prayed over this person. It says, bring them before the elders, plural, of the church. Why plural? Why more than one elder? So that... There's accountability that I don't, Gabe doesn't end up being some kind of healing ministry on his own. 
Hey, come to the elder Gabe who can pronounce healing over everyone. Have you seen those guys on TV or on the internet? Come to our healing service. This one person has this great power to heal everyone. It's a shenanigan. My dad had lung cancer and I prayed for that man and for gosh, through the whole time and God called him home. I prayed for other people and they still may still have the what they're suffering from, but I've also laid hands and prayed on one other person who when I did, bam, I actually felt the power leave my hand go into them. No lie. But that the majority were still, unfortunately, we're still waiting for God to heal them. But the command is, because think about it, if you're a Jew in this setting and you are dispersed and you're persecuted, you can't get back to your home doctors because they were cast out of society. That was the degree which they suffered such persecution. So they couldn't call up Dr. James or Dr. Bob or Dr. Maria and say, hey, I need some healing, I need some medicine. They were out there. They had to rely on the Spirit to heal them. Not only that, but think of modern-day missionaries. You're in the middle of the Amazon. How long is it going to take you to get to a doctor? You need to pray. That's why out there the supernatural goes on like crazy. But God loves to use even wisdom and modern medicine because he gave men medicine. But whether God chooses to heal supernaturally or through medicine, listen, doctors treat, but only God heals. You can take the medicine and still, unless God says, okay, I need, I'm going to use that medicine to do what I'm going to do and heal, it, you only last so long. Verse 15, and the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, please take note of that. He will be forgiven. Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be what? Say it again. Say it again. Now it moves on from not just the elders pray for to one another. Uh, confession has to happen first, doesn't it? Look in verse 16. What does it start? Do you guys know what confess means? It means to agree with God. Some of you may not agree that your sinful living is wrong. Some may justify, oh, I have every right to be angry and unforgiving towards my husband or my wife. They deserve it. They treated me like dog do today. Oh, I have every right to live in immorality. Why? Because, oh, I love my boyfriend or my girlfriend. We love each other, so therefore we can have sex. Really? Really? Well, Jim, I only smoke to get by once a week. I get drunk every other week because you know what? When the pressures of life get on, you know it's okay to have a couple of beers and drown out your sorrows, right? Really? I know. It's okay to lie. It's okay to be a hypocrite. It's okay, it's okay. If Man, if I hear another Christian say it's okay when the Bible says it's not okay, man, it breaks my heart. Do you want to be healed? Sometimes I think people don't. That's the sad truth. Do you know in the Gospel of John, there was a man who was lying on his bed for 38 years, and the first question Jesus asked this guy is, do you want to be made whole? Why would you ask the most basic question, of course? But he doesn't say, yes, Lord. He actually makes an excuse. Some just don't really want to confess to God what's really wrong, the sin they really struggle with, because that's where confession starts. We should confess our sins to the Lord every day. Do you guys know the Christian bar of soap? 
1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us. That's great. But if you're intending to go right back to your sin, here's where it helps. Confess your trespasses to one another. Hey, t find a brother, find a sister, if you're a sister, and a brother to a brother. What's struggling? What's bothering? What's hindering you? What sin is there? So you can be made whole, held accountable for your sin. This is what is, I believe, lacks in so much of Christendom. Because we're ashamed to talk to one another about the very thing that we're struggling with. And we can't confess it because, oh, well, they'll just judge me. They'll make fun of me. They'll throw me under the bus. So you know what we do? Get out your Christian broom. Whoosh, throw it under the rug. Whoosh, 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 whoosh. We sweep our marital issues under the rug. We sweep our personal problems under the rug. We sweep all kinds of sin under the proverbial Christian rug. And we wonder why life doesn't get better. We hide. What happened when Adam and Eve sinned? What did they do? Did they confess it? No, they didn't. God says, hey, why are you hiding? Why are you naked? Right? Do you remember that account in Genesis? Go read it on your own. But notice what it says in verse 16. The effective fervent prayers. That phrase in the Greek is literally just one word, and it's where you get the Greek word energy from. The energizing prayer of a righteous man avails much. It tells me a couple of things. Our prayers have power. Our prayers have a lot of power. If you think of the term horsepower, do you guys know how many horsepower is in your engine, men? Ugh. I remember CJ bought his new Mustang. He's like, yo, it's got some serious horses, dude. Hear the engine. I'm like, power. I drive a minivan. You know what it does? Listen, real men drive minivans. That's what I'm going to start promoting. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but there's power. Do you know how much power there is? Do you know why there's power? Because go to Hebrews chapter 4. You can't miss this. When we go... To the Lord in prayer, where are you coming to? Verse 16, Hebrews chapter 4, 16. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may, we may obtain mercy and find grace to help us in the time of need. When we pray, we go together as a family before God Almighty, boldly. I love that word. When you think of the word bold, boldness. Boldly. What comes to your mind? Do you think of this timid little warrior? Here's how we're going to fight. Do you think of Shaggy from Scooby-Doo? Right? <laughs> Every time they went on a mission, that guy was so scared out of his brains. No. Bold. I think of some great warrior. You, get, you and I get to come before God together and say, we are going to call down heaven upon your disease, upon your condition, upon your trial. You need God to provide, we're going to pray for it. You need some healing some hope, some encouragement, we're going to pray for that. And we will watch together heaven move on your behalf. That's the power of prayer. But just like anything in this life, most often either something that's powered by a battery or needs to be plugged in, you know what happens? We stop praying. You pull the plug on your prayers. Well, why? You stop coming to the throne together. 
the battery does wear out. We wear out. Because you know what? A lot of prayers are not answered immediately as much as we want them to. Would you all agree? Don't we wish God worked on our timetable? God, man. Listen, I prayed last week. Where's my answer? Um, I prayed last night. You're still not here? What if God said, hey, if you pray, listen, I'm just hypothetically putting, if God said, whatever your problem is, hey, if you pray for five straight years, I'll answer you. Would you do it? Oh, everyone, oh, yeah, yeah, sign me up, yeah, yeah, yeah. Then why don't you do it? Because he just might take you up on that. It might not be five years, it might be two years. My poor wife has to suffer so bad because, you know what? Jim's prayers are always answered, but man, we wait for it. Honey, I'm barren again. We're trying to have our second child. It's not happening. But we're praying. There's power. Hey, I need a job. I need provision. Do you believe God's going to answer that? Yeah, guess what? Start singing out in glorious prayer praise how wonderful he is even when your dirt broke when you don't have two pennies to rub together start praying and worshiping do you have a sin struggle hey my pride is too big i don't listen to anyone but me are you one of those kind of christians you're always right Pastor's never right. The Bible's certainly never right. It's just I do Christianity my way. And there will be never any other way. I lead the worship team. I lead this ministry. I lead discipleship group. It's my way. You do it only my way. You make the application. But it says this, we should confess to one another. That's why when you allow me to teach you verse by verse, together in our discipleship groups, it becomes a form for the men to be able to confess to the men the things that they're struggling with. And the women get to do the same. There is a method. Listen, I'm crazy, but I'm not stupid. There's a method to my madness. But if I can't get you in your Bible to say, this is what's wrong with me, and be okay with saying that, you may be stuck in that sin for the rest of your life. Because you and I can go to God and say, well, I have an idol, right? But then what do you do, right? After you get done telling God, here's the idol, what do you do? You take that idol back. Hey, here's my lust. Oh, I want it back. Here's my greed. Give it back. Hey, my marriage is broken. Whatever. I'll just live that way. Because we need to confess, and we have to, the word says, agree with God on what he says. Do we really agree with what he says about you and I, my sin? James says, pray about it. Pray about it. Go to the Lord and say, man, do I need to confess. Start with God and say, okay, God, which brother, if I'm a brother, or which sister do I need to begin and can I begin to open up and share what my struggle is? I encourage you to do that. And continue to pray always. Why? Because Elijah comes into the picture. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three years and six months, and he prayed again, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its fruit. If you read the account that's written in 1 Kings chapter 17 and 18, you'll find this. When it came time for James to pray for the rain again, he had to pray more than one time. For a prophet, that's pretty remarkable. Why? Because normally when these guys prayed, it was a one and done. Hey, the Lord said, it's going to happen, and boom, it was done. Boom, it happened. Boom. 
right? Not this time. He had to pray how many times? Seven. What's the seven a representation of? The number of perfection and completion. There is a perfect number of times that we should and continuously pray for, even if it means we pray for the rest of our lives about something. That may be the perfect number. God wants to heal. That's the name of our ministry. Redeemed is for the lost and restored is for the Christian because we are all in need of healing on a continuous basis. The last point, the purposes of praying. First was reason number one, we suffer. Number two, we are sick. Number three, we stray. Verses 19 and 20 say this, Brethren, if anyone among you wanders, circle that word for wanders, because we're going to come back to it, your translation may say error from the truth, and someone turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. Brethren, if anyone among you wanders. It literally means to be led astray or to fall away. Why is that important to note? Because if you're not led and being led by the Holy Spirit, at any given moment, you could be led to the path of the dark side. Let's be honest. I won't bring them up. They know who they are. We just had, a, had an issue this morning. Two brothers were being led astray. I saw it. I recognized it. I jumped in, and what did I do? I said, hey, we need to fix this immediately because this sounds like the enemy. You're being led by a mistake. There was a sin involved. A miscommunication happens all the time. But one little mistake, man, can lead to a great amount of wandering. Next thing you know, you've got bitterness and there's uncomfortableness. And I don't want to be around these people or these people. Or, uh, it only takes one wrong step out of step. Right? I'm walking with the Lord. Everything is good. I'm doing right. And then the enemy, oh, I follow the wrong direction. Have you ever gotten lost? Anyone here? Raise your hand if you've ever been driving and gotten lost. It all started on the first wrong turn you took. Why did you take that first wrong turn? Anyone? You were singing. <laughs> Why else? How did you get lost? Did you intend to get lost? Hey, you know what? Uh, men, we're not humble. We don't ask for directions. I know where I'm going. Come on, I've said that <laughs> Honey, I know where I'm going. And then when we're lost, I'm blaming her. I know. Oh, oh, look, see, we're confessing. This is great. We'll just turn at the next light. And then the next light's like 68 miles long. <laughs> I let you laugh because you know it's true. I'm not the only one that's done this. To stay on course as a true disciple is not always easy. That's why we need to pray. And certainly James has in mind people that have wandered away from the true faith. True faith. Now let me give you one example because this is what the Lord really impressed upon my heart. In our culture, in our society, where we live today, why there may be so few disciples and, and a lot of believers is because man the pressures and the concerns of this world constantly influence Christians to take one wrong step that lead them a slow path of wandering. What do I mean by this? Can you go to 2 Timothy chapter 4? Because Paul, when he writes, he gives a personal example. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, Look in verse 10. 
Everybody there. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10 says, For Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world, and has departed for Thessalonica, Cretans for Galatia, Titus for Dalmatia. But it says he has the love for this world. What happened to Demas? Was he Paul's number two guy behind Timothy? Was he a faithful brother until because of the pressures and concerns and cares for this world? Listen, this one. The desire to have security in this world. The desire to have what this world offers. The desire to fit into this world. It got too much and he made a decision to leave and abandon the Apostle Paul. Do you see that? Can I hear you? If he could do it, and this guy followed Paul. Well, Jim, you know, uh, uh, you know, you, you understand, I, I gotta, I, I gotta go do this. I gotta go take this job. I gotta go live this way and go here or do this. Because the pressures, like Demas, I gotta have what this world has. I gotta be secure. It caused someone that was living the life of a disciple to go back into the world. What is James saying? In light of this, why we should be praying for wanderers? Why should we pray for those, I call them strayers. Some may say backslidden. It starts with when church isn't important. When gathering together with the saints just becomes, you know what, it's not that important, it's optional, I can do it whenever I feel like it. That's how it starts. See, many of us can come to church, but how many of us are really connected to the church? Coming to church is a good start. I definitely encourage you to be here every Sunday, as many Sundays as you can. But I also say, you need to connect to the church so it goes from Sunday to also Monday and Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Saturday. Not that you get together every single day, but you're connected to people within the fellowship on a regular basis. When that becomes not as important, guess what it opens the door? Well, step two is then you'll say, you know, I don't really need to come to church at all. And the wandering gets worse. Listen, I'm speaking from experience. I've watched Christians who say, hey, once I was on fire, then they stop coming to church. Then they stop coming to discipleship group. They begin to pull out all together. And you watch this waterfall effect. When they pull out of church, well, guess what? Then they pull out of reach. So now, just as an example, if Ernie was that guy, which he's not, But if he stops coming to church and he stops being part of discipleship group and he begins to remove himself, then what happens? I try to go to him and say, yo, where are you? Haven't seen you. Well, you know what, Jim? I got more important things to do. Whatever those important things are, he's not working out his faith. He's not being connected to the body. And then that leads to just full-on backsliding. Are you being tested? God is asking you to endure something for his name's sake, and it's hard. Because if you think about that, when the hardships come, we should be closer to one another than ever before. But here's what usually you find. When difficulties come, that's when Christians run. When the difficulties come, that's when everybody scatters to their own homes, to back to their own shadows, their own life, and they stop staying connected. Listen, you'll be able to tell if you've strayed. Have you experienced a spiritual drought in your life? Do you notice some death and decay in your spiritual walk? Do you notice? Because you used to be so connected. We used to be so close. You used to be so deep in the word, in prayer, in loving one another. And now things have begun to slowly rot away. The slow decay. 
It's like my god-awful teeth. I refuse to put away the M&Ms. And you know what happens? That sugar sits on the teeth. And even though I brush, it's only a matter of time before Jim needs, which you guys have heard, I've had nine or ten root canals. I've had four gum surgeries. If I would just stay away from that, I'd be fine. But that's my, that's, listen. That, that's my sin. I love M&M's. It's not just them. Hey. But if you walk out of here, and I remember I once heard a pastor say this. Whatever you're not willing to work at, then what do you, why are you praying for it? Because when you pray, it tells me you should put some energy into it. You should do all you can do, and then the Lord does what he can do. And only he can do. To some, forgiveness. Hey, man, I need to work at forgiving this person because I hate them. Okay, start there. Start there, but work at it. Hey, I really need to get connected because I come to this church or any church. Maybe you have a different home church and you're just visiting, but you're not connected. We grow, and listen, Ask the family, ask the Ernie's, ask the Ron and Linda's, ask the John and Lawrence. If you don't stay connected, you end up slowly dying. You start to stray. When there's nobody to say, hey, I just want to help. What are you going through? What are you struggling? What sin? What problem? What issue is really going on? People pay for this. Don't you, don't you know people go to counselors for this? You pay big bucks for them. We do it for free. You don't need to be ashamed. But Demas stands as a man who's written in all eternity as a man who once was, listen, he might have been the next great missionary, the next pastor, the next preacher, but he sold out and he went to a comfortable life in the world. And that's the last we read of him. Some, uh, you, listen, the death of your very calling may be at stake because you're starting to stray. That needing something that the world has, but spiritually Jesus says, no, I'm just testing you. Wait for me. Wait on me. I have something better. A high calling. Are we willing to recognize, though, if we're straying from the faith? Because what should we do? Please, everyone, verse 20, this is where we close. Let him know or she know. you got to tell them. Do you see that? Let them know. But guess what? Don't expect them to just say, Oh, thank you for telling me. I'm so glad you told me I was a sinner and making mistakes. You don't ever get that. You know what you get? Well, I heard otherwise. God's telling me. Just leave me alone. <sighs> I had a brother. Came out of rehab, drug rehab, for the like double-digit time. And when I said, and I found him in drugs again, you know what I said to him? You have two kids. You need to live for them, man. You need to call me when you're driving to Camden to get those drugs. And you know what he did? He left the church. Because he didn't want to hear it. So I get it. Listen, and I'm just the messenger. You can kill the messenger all day long. You can tell me I'm wrong. And I may be wrong at times because I'm not perfect. But if you find yourself distant, discouraged, growing cold, you know, I've lost that passion and that fire, I guarantee you'll find some truth here that maybe you're just straying a bit. Hey, I need to start picking up my phone and calling my brothers if I'm a brother or sister if I'm my sisters. Can we stand? Can I have the worship team come up and sing one last song for us? I have the oil. If you need prayer for anything, if you're going through a hardship and you need praying, if you're sick, 
and need prayer. Maybe the miracle will happen today. Maybe it'll be the, today the day that God says, I'm going to heal you. But if it's not, tomorrow, we're going to pray again for you. Listen, James ends his book with no lovely conclusion. He doesn't say, now grace and peace to you. Hey, he doesn't say, hey, God bless you. you know, he ends with a command and an exhortation that we as a community of disciples would open up and say, we need to pray. I need help. Here's what I'm going to ask you to do. Provided that it's not a... I want men right now get with one man as they're singing the song. Find one person to pray with before you go. Women, you do the same. Get with one woman in this church. Could be the person next to you, in front of you, and back of you. And say, hey, pray for me because we all need prayer. 